Hi, my name is Marie Conley, and I'm today's moderator, a member of the organizing committee of CRESS, along with Ian Schmutt and the PIs of this project, Lars Villuber and Alexander Michuda. I'm also both a former graduate student and a current faculty member, and thus vested and interested uh, in today's topic. Um, thank you for joining us today. The Conference on Reproducibility and Replicability in Economics and the Social Sciences is a series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on the topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. This is the 10th session. If you missed any of our previous sessions, we've posted them on YouTube. The link is on our website. Our panels discuss educational and procedural barriers slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made uh, to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage, and implications for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. I really hope you enjoyed today's webinar, The Integration of Reproducibility into Social Science Graduate Education. Today, we are joined by three panelists. Julian Reif is Associate Professor of Finance and Economics at Gies College of Business, University of Illinois. He is an applied microeconomist whose research focuses on the determinants and value of health. He has studied the health and medical spending effects of air pollution, the health and drug utilization effects of Medicare Part D, and the value of medical innovation. He is also a principal investigator of the Illinois Workplace Wellness Study. In the space of today's talk, he is also the author and maintainer of a detailed guide on how to create reproducible projects in Stata. Jeremy Fries is professor of sociology and chair of the sociology department at Stanford University. His work is interested broadly in the relationship between social differences and individual differences and between social advantage and embodied advantage. He is co-PI on a number of public goods projects utilizing very large data sets, including the GSS and ISSB. Some of, his, some of his projects also aim to improve the practice and conceptualization of social research, including survey practices, causal thought, and research regarding the rise of meta-analysis and open science. This work includes being co-author on a book on how to conduct transparent and reproducible social science research. And David Wasser is an economist studying labor markets and inequality. He received his PhD from Cornell University in 2023, just wrapping up. Later this year, he will join the US Census Bureau. He is a co-author on a paper describing the work conducted by the LDI Replication Lab with the help of undergraduate students, together with Laz Huber and several other graduate students but here brings his very recent experience as a graduate student to bear. We look forward to hearing from our expert panelists and to your questions. Each panelist will start with a brief statement followed by a discussion where we will turn uh, to audience questions at about the 40 minute mark. Feel free to enter questions into the Q&A at any time and we will pose them to our panelists. And so now we start. We start with you, Julian Reif. Julian. As I mentioned in my short introduction, you wrote a guide on how to create reproducible projects in Stata. How do that guide and other similar initiatives fit in graduate education in economics? All right. Uh, well, uh, th thanks, Marie, for inviting me to talk about this uh, important topic. Um, I have brought a few slides, which I will uh, share uh, now to sort of um, give my thoughts and perspective on this topic. Um, and I thought I would start um, with just a quick uh, definition um, about uh, of reproducibility. So when I when I mention reproducibility, um, I'm referring specifically to uh, computational reproducibility. So that is, or the the ability to exactly reproduce numerical estimates from uh, raw data. So the the ideal standard that I uh, usually have in mind is what would pe what people often refer to as uh, a push button analysis. All right? So by executing a single script, the computer starts with raw files that were given to the researcher. Uh, and then that script produces all of the tables, the figures, estimates, and so on uh, that are part uh, of the final published paper. So uh, why is this important? So from my perspective, uh, there's at least two distinct reasons 
uh, why this is an important uh, topic that we should uh, uh, be teaching uh, uh, to students as early as possible. So, so first, you know, by, by omitting manual tasks like copy pasting numbers or reformatting data files by hand, uh, we can minimize mistakes that arise during the course of ordinary data analysis. So when every analytical step is documented in a script, it allows the researcher to easily verify uh, their results, right? So this is something that all of us researchers should care about because it helps us get, uh, get the right answer. Um, but a, a second reason uh, that's also important is that a well-documented reproducible analysis also allows others to learn from and build on your research, which is a point that uh, David Molitor and I emphasized in a recent policy brief that we wrote together. So I remember when I was in graduate school, uh, one of the ways I, for example, learned to run a triple differences regression uh, was by consulting code that I obtained from an author who had published a well-known paper using that, uh, using that method. So for a lot of students, having working code for methodology is a valuable way to learn. Uh, and of course, if somebody wants to extend your research, having the, the raw data and the code that allows them to reproduce uh, your main re results allows them to do that uh, uh, more easily. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not that easy to write reproducible code. Uh, so there's lots of things that can go wrong. Uh, sometimes the problem is just bad organization. Uh, your code refers to an intermediate file, uh, which you can't regenerate, for example. Um, sometimes the problem is in the code itself. Uh, maybe you thought you were doing a unique sort, um, but you didn't confirm that in your code. And now there is a random element uh, somewhere in the code that produces different numbers every time you rerun it. Uh, or your analysis may rely on add-on packages that you downloaded uh, at one point in time, but now those features have changed uh, or the package has been updated. Uh, and this causes bugs when people with the newer version of the package try to run your code. Um, uh, or another issue uh, that I've seen a lot is that, you know, you might have an analysis that runs on your computer, but it doesn't run on someone else's computer who's using a different operating system. You know, a, a very common uh, way that this happens is with path names, for example, they're different on Mac versus uh, PC and Unix and so on. Um, there's lots of other issues that I'm sure uh, many of us have encountered uh, before. Um, so it, it's not easy to do. Uh, that means that it's something that, you know, we really need to teach uh, to students. Uh, and, and given its importance, um, I think uh, it's definitely something that should be taught in the classroom as opposed to having to learn it uh, on your own in the final years of your PhD program, which is how many students do it today. Um, and not everybody needs to learn it. Uh, I think reproducibility uh, is less important for a theoretical macroeconomist, for example, than it is for applied economists. Uh, so I think it's best incorporated into a second year applied econometrics course. Um, I would recommend that instructors teach both general principles, uh, such as how to organize and document analyses, uh, as well as more technical material, um, which might be specific uh, to a particular programming language. And, you know, there's a lot of ways uh, instructors can do this. Uh, so here's just uh, uh, one example that I put together that could be used uh, for students that are learning difference and differences uh, in an applied econometrics class. So a typical assignment might be to have students download a bunch of surveys uh, and then run a regression that, say, you know, estimates the effect of cigarette taxes on cigarette consumption. Um, the students will produce a write-up, uh, which will typically uh, include some figures and tables and discussion. So I think as part of the assignment, uh, an instructor which is inter who is interested in teaching reproducibility could al also emphasize that all of the analysis uh, needs to be professionally documented and reproducible. So for example, you can ask students to create a readme uh, and upload that to GitHub where they can be graded uh, on the thoroughness of the documentation. Um, at the end of the assignment, students could also then try to run uh, each other's analyses. I think this is especially useful if they're written in different languages, right? Can a student who's never used Python before 
run a Python analysis that was written uh, by one of their classmates, right? So I think this is an effective way to learn how important uh, documentation uh, actually is, uh, especially from the perspective of a user who is not familiar uh, with that particular uh, environment. Um, and so I think the you know the the last thing I'll mention here is that there you know there are a lot of resources available out there of uh, for both instructors and students. Right, a lot of this stuff is not in textbooks yet sometimes, but uh, they're certainly available online. Uh, so for example. Um, I've made a, a guide available on my website that anybody is free to use. So it covers, uh, you know, general principles like how to organize your folders, uh, as well as uh, specific technical issues like how to create uh, a local library uh, in Stata. Um, and so as part of this guide, I also include an up-to-date list of links to other guides and resources out there that I've come across over the years. Um, and so I'm always updating this list. So if anybody here or who's listening to this uh, uh, webinar has put together materials that I don't know about, please feel free to send it to me uh, and I'll add it to the list. Um, and so I think I'll uh, stop stop there and um, uh, we can move on to the next uh, the next panelist. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian. Um, Next, uh, we have Jeremy, Jeremy Fries. So Jeremy, you are from another discipline, sociology. We just had an economist talk to us. And you also wrote on conducting uh, reproducible research uh, with book, your book and recent work. So how do you incorporate those practices into teaching graduate students? And, and, and I'd be interested to hear any uh, differences and contrast between sociology and economics. Sure. So I think that there are two uh, really important differences uh, in terms of teaching this between sociology and economics. So in in sociology, one is is not assured by any means that an entering graduate student is uh, even planning on doing statistical research uh, as their dissertation. So I'm half or more of students who enter uh, graduate school in, in sociology are interested in qualitative research, either historical or ethnographic or some other form, even though they, they are required to take uh, statistics uh, courses. Some are interested in mixed methods, so they have to learn some stuff um, for that. Uh, and then the other is that uh, empirical sociology journals, uh, the, uh, the flagship ones, for example, uh, do not yet have requirements about having to make uh, code or data available. I think that it's lamentable, but I uh, have to live in that world. And so uh, it's not the case that uh, that they that I can tell them that they're going to have to do this um, uh, in life. I can tell them they're going to have to do this in my class. Um, but I, I think that there are uh, some important principles that that under that that I try to sort of convey and and get across. And I just want to kind of present some big picture things. Uh, rather than slides, I'm going to have signs uh, because then I can look at my notes. But I think that, uh, plus it's summer and I'm feeling odd. But um, so the first thing that I think is important is uh, I really try to confront uh, code shyness, which is, I think, is an important barrier to sharing in sociology. The first thing that I think is important is uh, I really try to confront uh, code shyness, which is I think is an important barrier to sharing in sociology. So what I mean by code shyness is uh, insecurity about code, either that there's a lurking error in the code, or even if uh, one is comfortable about uh, one's code, um, uh, that, that it's correct, that that one feels like the code is so ugly or otherwise amateurish in its construction that they don't want to share uh, other people to see it because they'll they'll look at them badly for for seeing it and I, and I, I feel like that's a real barrier uh, to people being willing to share code even people who are confident that they're doing good work uh, that they've done a lot to check that their code is correct um, I think for instruction one of the the uh, key things to to realize one just to convey that this is uh, as a kid say, a thing, um, and something that uh, that they should recognize that is something that a lot of people feel. Um, uh, 
and something to get over to surmount that uh, providing a lot of examples of good code is a way. I mean, I think one of the reasons people get code shy is that they are doing things that nobody has ever really taught them how to do and they had to figure out on their own and they and uh there's there's reasons computer scientists exist and teach things is that there's a practice to it that is uh that is important um and so i try to and then of course having them do it having them do things and and looking over that is there's there's no substitute for that but in one way or another uh trying to just give them examples examples of things being done right uh i think is very important um, and then because it's not necessarily required, um, or maybe not required, you have perfect careers as a sociologist without ever anybody seeing your code ever, um, uh, as alarming as that might sound to economists, um, that I think it's really important to kind of emphasize the benefits to self of doing that kind of thing. Um, of course, I do the kind of communal kind of rah-rah idealism, open science kind of stuff too. But I think by um by opening by um emphasizing the kinds of benefits to uh, how is this how is this in my interest to do this to do it and i the, the one that i i really kind of hammer on to them is the extent to which their future selves are going to thank them uh for doing uh reproducible work that is to say that um that you know, students don't necessarily realize how long the gestation of projects is when they do research that that you work in a flurry. And even if you work in a flurry all the way to sending it out, which is, of course, as you get older, it's harder to do that. Um, that then it comes back and reviewers want things and they want changes and they want new analyses. Um, and uh, that makes uh, is much more efficient when you do things the right way, because a lot of times the way that you do things that is the right way for somebody else to understand your code is also the way that's going to help you in the future figure out what it was that you did in the first place. And so I, I, I definitely push back and push back very strongly on any idea that doing things in a reproducible way takes more time, because I tell them like it might in that session, you might do something in 45 minutes that would have taken an hour to do it the right way, but then you come back and it comes back on an R&R &R and you waste two days trying to get yourself up to speed to remember what your poorly put together code does. So I, I really try to emphasize that. I also, as a pedagogical thing, and I believe this very wholeheartedly, at least in sociology, is that, I don't know if these are working or not, I guess not, I'll just give up the signs. Sorry, Lars, but <laughs> the better way to do things is usually the clearer way. Um, what I mean by that is that a lot of times when students are struggling with something uh, to understand something statistically, if they're also, that is to say not in a class, but in life and in code, if they're also doing the coding badly and they're, they're not doing good practice, often the output and stuff is more messed up in terms of how it looks. And it is actually harder to understand what is going on. One of the things that I think is good about having good practice, it, and, it's, and it's perverse, the more the, the more sophisticated you are doing things in good practice, the easier you make it to actually understand. And so the lower the barrier that that takes uh, to injure. So I try to under, emphasize that the better way is usually the clearer way. And then also just that, that they become better collaborators, they become better research assistants, they'll become better down the line at being able to coordinate research assistants themselves if they are doing practice in the right way and in a way that, that is, is reproducible. And then the last thing that I really try to kind of emphasize in different ways that I think is a little bit more subtle and wanted to emphasize is the value of using uh, sustainable coding practice. What do I mean by sustainable coding practice? I mean a coding practice that sure they can do in an example for my class or when doing things in that kind of level, but actually also make sense as something that they will do in the wild in their own work and help it be something that is easier to integrate. And for that, two things that I think are really important is one, a subtle issue, but is is the value of using self-documenting names. I think that students otherwise, they follow this weird uncanny curve where they go from under documenting things and not really understanding how to document things. But the most conscientious students will go from that to a phase where they over document and they document a bunch of things. They put a lot of dates and things in there and, and things that 
one, I, I don't think that they are going to subsequently be doing it that way, or they'll get the idea that documentation is, is more of a chore than it needs to be to follow work. And then also, I think when you over document code, you actually don't read that code again subsequently. So it actually defeats the purpose of documentation. And so I try to very much encourage trying to figure out a Goldilocks level of documentation that is the right kind of level for somebody else to be able to follow work without feeling like you're writing a technical report. And a big feature for that that I emphasize is the value of self-documenting names. Um, that is to say, giving things mnemonically straightforward names when recoding, um, uh, both for internal things, but also for variable names and things makes the output clearer too. Um, but in that way, rather than have a line of documentation or two lines that explain what a variable name is, give the variable itself its clearest possible name and do as much documentation as you can that way. And then the other thing that I really try to emphasize towards sustainable coding is uh, doing uh, having templates or other things like that, um, even if it's your own personal uh, template or things. Basically, where, for example, I encourage, you know, here's a directory structure I always use for a quantitative project. I would encourage you to use exactly this structure, but if you want to use a different structure, the thing is, try to use exactly that same structure every time, and then you never have to think about it. Um, the same way with certain features of a code file, uh, perhaps just use this as a starting template and you don't have to think about it. You can just appropriate it new and it gets you started uh, on the right path. So those I think are the main points that I try to emphasize in teaching in sociology. Oh, also before we, I also do have a site where I talk about um, uh, some of the uh, practices I recommend in more detail. And that is at, uh, this here QR code, which will go into the video. Boom. Okay. There. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Yep. Um, and uh, up next, we have David, David Wasser. So David, you have just completed a PhD in economics. Um, and you've uh, worked both on public use data as well as confidential data, including at the Census Bureau and in Denmark. But you uh, also have worked in private sector research institutes as well as the government. What, in retrospect, would you have liked to learn earlier in your graduate career? Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I want to start quickly with a disclaimer because I will be joining the Census Bureau, perhaps by the time that this video is up, that these views are mine and not those of the Census Bureau. Um, I need to get used, used to, I guess, giving that disclaimer at the top of all my talks. Um, yeah, as mentioned earlier, um, I was fortunate to work with Lars Vilhuber in the LDI Replication Lab at Cornell uh, early on in, in my graduate career. And so I was exposed to a lot of deep uh, learning about the reproduci reproducible practices uh, early on in my graduate career, which, I'm, which is very fortunate for me. Uh, but most, if not all of my classmates were not, um, either in a formal way or even really in an informal way, depending on how their research progressed during the time they were a graduate student. And so as a result, because you know my, my classmates knew about my work with the replication lab, I frequently fielded questions from them uh, as they interacted with journal data policies or journal rep reproducibility policies, either with the AEA journals or, or other journals in particular. Um, we would discuss, I would discuss with them, you know, core tenets of computational reproducibility and sort of help them understand what to expect from these processes and how best to satisfy both the letter of these policies, but also their spirit um, so that they can continue to apply these practices going forward in future projects, even when there's submitting you know, to a journal that doesn't have a specific guideline or, or a requirement in place. However, you know, as I think this was mentioned earlier that these discussions seem to always come at the end of the life cycle of the publication process, right? The paper has been accepted or conditionally accepted, but now the authors need to overcome, you know, in scare quotes, one last hurdle before publication. Um, and you sometimes see this also being discussed every so often, you know, on Twitter as well, where, you know, the reproducibility policy at a given journal um, or the AEA policies will come up for discussion. 
inevitably someone, usually an economist who can only or is overly focused on unintended consequences, will say, oh, you know, this adds, this is bad, this is actually a bad policy because it adds to the length of an already long publication time. And, you know, I think, I think Jeremy emphasized this, which is that it doesn't have to, um, this is like part of a life cycle. Um, and, and so I, I think this is the, this is the key problem with these types of arguments and the timing of the questions that I would receive from, from my classmates is that they, is there's sort of a failure to understand that really reproducibility should, should be incorporated in the life cycle of, of a research project. Um, Reproducible concepts should be included from the first day, you know, that researchers are touching code or data, um, setting up a directory structure, um, for example, or, or README, for example. Um, and I think this is the key idea that needs to be included in, in graduate education, which is that reproducibility concepts are a key ingredient for producing high quality, credible research and should be incorporated um, throughout the life cycle of a paper. And, and I really want to stress this point that reproducibility adds to the credibility of research. Um, you know, within economics, uh, our field underwent what's been called a credibility revolution in, in, the, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And, and this, this movement emphasized research designs that in their transparency lent more credibility to the paper's findings and um, in that transparency, allow the reader to better understand how the authors were able are, are going to attempt to identify uh, the answers to their research question, the specific data sample and sample that they would be using, the choices they made along the way in creating that sample, and three, how robust their answer uh, their answer is to reasonable perturbations of these assumptions. And you know, today essentially all empirical economics papers contain the same core components in order to lead the reader through the research in a straightforward and predictable manner. Predictable manner. Um, you know, sometimes this approach uh, to laying out assumptions and, and choices being made along the way. I think it might have been John DiNardo who first coined the term sort of hands above the table econometrics or a hands above the table approach to research. And I view computational reproducibility as a logical extension uh, of this tradition. Um, and I believe it should be taught as such at the graduate level in our methods courses, as Julian mentioned. Um, you know, I did not take a, a class that was explicitly labeled how to write a paper. Um, instead, we, we read examples of well-written papers discuss the quality of the presentation of the results, the defense of the assumptions needed to reach the preferred conclusions. And in this way, we were shown models of how to write a paper, including the components that are essential for creating high quality, credible research. And you know, in these methods classes, these also involved frequently replication exercises. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the word replication here, meaning you know, we were tasked with um, reading a paper, seeing a and a particular table or figure we would have to from scratch download the data and generate from our, from from source uh, you know a reproduction or a replication of, of that analysis. Um, this could be extended to <laughs> include reproduction exercises, and I think, uh, as Julian mentioned, I think I think a key component here that's like a really valuable thing that the graduate education experience allows for is you can do this with a classmate's work. Um, either within an individual course or, um, you know, within, in econ PhD programs, I think the same is true in sociology, you need to produce uh, a second year paper, a third year paper that has to be, you know, uh, is a part of your requirement for continuing on in the program. And that's meant to sort of get students hands dirty with research and like show them from start to finish how to write a paper. Adding reproducible or reproducible component to that is a very natural extension when it makes sense. You know, again, theoretical macroeconomists, as Julian said, probably don't need this. Um, and so uh, I think this is like a very logical place to stick this into the graduate curriculum. Stick it in the methods class, add it as a component to the second year paper, the third year paper, whatever your program wants to call it. I think another component here um, that's important to stress is that, um, you know, especially is especially true, I've noticed 
for both in my experience working prior to graduate school and in graduate school. And people coming, students coming straight from undergrad or straight from undergrad to a master's to grad to a PhD program or to a work environment. Um, it's very important for, for these students to understand that, you know, producing research is not the same as turning in a homework assignment. Um, research is a living, breathing thing that other people will interact with, hopefully for a very long time after it's been, after a paper has been accepted by a journal. And so researchers need to produce analyses that can be easily understood. You know, Jeremy spent time talking about well-documented code. Um, analyses can be easily understood by other researchers without needing, you know, complex directions or spending hours trying to pour through and identifying how a particular table or figure was produced from posted code in the, in the hope that there is posted code. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think I also want to emphasize, you know, that, you know, formally teaching reproducible concepts is, is also incentival, incentive compatible across all of the people involved in making that happen. For the students, you know, the next generation of scholars will know how to incorporate these concepts into their own research. For the faculty who are either teaching these students or who are employing these students as research assistants, you know, they're going to understand these concepts. It's going to allow for better handoffs of projects from one research assistant to another, um, which is a very common uh, time consuming pro uh, point in any, any life cycle of any project. Um, it can also help be helpful for um, when students are RAs on a paper that's just been accepted and needs to go through uh, a replication process. For journals, you know, these above, th these points hold as well for students, uh, the points about students and faculty as well. Um, it's going to help strengthen the reliability of the research published at these journals and um, provided that they, you know, require some sort of reproducibility check or posting of code or data. And for consumers of research, again, it's going to implicitly add more reliability and more credibility to the research. If, if I can go into a paper and say, okay, this is exactly how they produce this analysis, whether I'm familiar with the data or not, um, I can understand exactly how this is, this is happening. Um, and I think this provides lots of benefits to, you know, producing additional research, standing on the shoulders uh, of what other people have produced. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, David. And I would like to also thank all the panelists for the thought provoking and interesting material. And I will now open up the floor for uh, questions. So um, if you have questions, please enter them uh, in the, in the Q&A. We uh, welcome further queries to a particular panelists or broader questions directed to one or more panelists. Alex will be monitoring the Zoom Q&A for, uh, for questions. And um, I believe we already have uh, a couple questions. So, uh, so I will read, read one out to you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mario Maliki, which was a, a you know, general question, but I think it was during Jeremy's uh, talk. So uh, I don't know exactly who it's directed to, but um, the question is uh, rephrased a little bit, but how important of a time investment is it to teach reproducible code when many software suites don't have a good way to create reproducible code. And he's particularly listing SPSS, MedCalc, or JASP. Um, so what happens when you're creating uh, your output uh, without code, let's say? Sure. Uh, well, so I think this is uh, a fascinating, important question. I mean, I think in many domains of life, we're trying to figure out what the chat GPTs uh, of the world are, how they're going to change things. Uh, I certainly, um, uh, even in teaching this spring, uh, uh, have leaned into uh, telling students that chat GPT is great for uh, providing uh, examples of uh, code, including in response to very complicated queries. I think that uh, I do emphasize that they need to check that that actually works as advertised, because of course it, it, it doesn't always, but it's just going to get better um, uh, in that respect. Um, so I think in that regard, the idea of using these models to, to help code and the extent to which that will uh, be a complement to teaching coding practice, especially if it helps people to see examples of, of well-written code, if it develops in that way, is, is going to be super important. I do 
instruct and I guess feel uh, a strong skepticism. I mean, Jasp, Jasp, I believe now has a feature where you can get the underlying R syntax for operations. It did not at the beginning. I thought that that was catastrophic myself, just because, you know, the way I both think about it and try to explain things is, is, you know, you do an analysis and then you often have to tweak or redo or that analysis in, in practice and as well as be able to document for somebody else exactly what you did. And I don't see any great, I mean, if it ends up being that being able to provide reproducible prompts to a large language model gets you to that end, that would be great and could help, I don't know, be the future. But, um, you know, in the absence of that, I still, I still think it's very hard for these things that do not involve code to be compatible with doing work that involves intricate analyses over a long gestation process. And I think that that's one of the reasons why you don't see very much SPSS, uh, which used to be dominant in my neck of the woods anymore, um, is that even when you do paste the syntax, it's not great syntax. And people want to go back and they want to be able to document what it was that they did. Yeah, I, I think this is, you know, related to a general question of sort of what kind of programming language to use in your analysis. And this has changed over the years. I mean, it, it, I'll, I, I could speak, you know, mostly to economics here. You know, 20, 25 years ago, sometimes an analysis was, you know, you download one small data file, which is a couple megabytes in size. You run four regressions. You have two tables and you're done. <clears throat> um that can be done in a lot of different uh, languages, even in something as simple as Excel. There's not that many steps to it, um, so it's not too hard to reproduce. Um, you know, fast forward to today, you have researchers dealing, they might be merging, you know, thousands of different files together, terabytes in size, um, writing, you know, uh, code uh, uh, analyses that take, you know, one to two years among a group of four to five people. Um, it's just inherently a very different project. And in that kind of project, I think, you know, as Jeremy pointed out, it's just absolutely necessary to have something that's reproducible um, from beginning to end. Um, and, you know, in, in economics, the most common languages uh, that I see today are Stata, R, and Python. Um, and all three of those allow you to um, uh, fully uh, script every single step of your process. So I think, it's uh, it's one of the things what one of these things that as we um, as we continue to use larger and more numerous data sets, it's just going to be uh, almost a requirement uh, that one uses uh, one of these um, uh, fairly sophisticated program programming languages. Uh, that said, you know I also agree. I think large language models do make this uh, a lot easier, um, especially if you're having to switch between different languages. Um, they they can help you. Uh, sort through the syntax uh, of the languages that you don't uh, know as well. Um, but even if you're working in a language you don't know uh, that well, um, it, it's still going to be important to have a script um, that, again, documents and reproduces all the steps that uh, uh, that you're taking in your analysis. Great. Um, and I have a question. I want to I uh, take you a little somewhere else. I, I don't think... Um, this was mentioned, but uh, for example, uh, Julian, you, had, you were showing an example of what you were doing in class with uh, with students to take take a data set and you know run the code, uh, get the output. Um, a lot of projects, uh, as you just mentioned, use very different uh, data sources, multiple data sources, and especially uh, confidential data sources that can only be accessed in a in a research data center or in a secure lab. And so how would you go on about teaching graduate students how to incorporate those practices in the lab when you like don't have access to the confidential data in your classroom? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I think in, in the classroom, I think it suffices to use publicly available data sets, um, such as the one that I, I gave in the example there. Um, I, again, I think a lot of the, the, the principles will carry over to when you're working um, in, in a confidential research. Now, actually, in some, in some ways, they're going to be even more important because oftentimes what happens is you have to write code. You write code locally on your computer. 
and then you have to you know you, you have to basically transfer it over uh, to another machine in the research data center and then run code over there. And you're running it on a different machine. You want to make sure everything uh, works well. Um, and I you know I, I don't know that um, those types of examples have to be covered in the classroom. Um, but I think a lot of what you learn, even just from a doing a reproducible analysis with publicly available data, um, will carry over uh, to a confidential uh, data set. Um, we uh, we have a question, I think, from Alex. Uh, so um, I don't know who wants to answer. Maybe David, uh, because it's about the responsibility of a professor. So the question is. To what extent is it a responsibility of the professor to teach a language that's more reproducibility ready versus using a language that is more ubiquitous in the field? So for example, should we teach Stata because it's more used in economics or move towards R or Python? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, happy to answer as the you know, non-professor on the panel. Um, I think uh, I think this is a, a sticky, difficult question. Um, I think that uh a lot of a lot of people within the economics profession specifically uh stick to stata because that's what they were taught um when when they were learning and, and they stick to stata going forward and uh that's just sort of how it goes i, I think it's less so for graduate students i would say um you know in in my experience thinking about all of the different uh projects that that my classmates they were probably on a, a five or six different languages um I, I would say and and i think it it matters project to project what is this the right the right um program to be using um in the classroom you know i think there's a lot to be said about something that is lower cost um both financially and in terms of learning um you know, many universities will be able to provide licenses for, for students for, for some uh, statistical software programs, but not all of them. Um, and uh, I think that's an important uh, limitation in some cases to, to teaching or requiring a specific language. Um, I think R is a great language for learning lots of basic stats and also learning um, more complex things as well. Um, and so it could be and it's free, this is readily readily available. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's hard to say that there's a one size fits all answer here. I think it just really is gonna depend um, in the classroom what fits best for the specific resources. Uh, one one thing I'll, I'll just add is I guess I, I would in, encourage uh, uh, professors or instructors um, to you know provide uh, or have their, TA provide a you know solution key with very well written um, code in, in in at least one language, and I think students should be free to you know they if they want to use a different language. I think that's that's fine. Um, personally, I would prefer to see well written code in a language that I'm less familiar with, and really bad code written in a language that I know I know better. Um, but then the key is to at least provide a, an example of one. Here, here is a set of code, whether it's in Stata, R, or Python, which is fully reproducible, which is very clear. Um, and a lot of things will carry over. I, I, one of the things that Jerry me mentioned, which I agree with a lot, is you know having good names for variables, right? And that's you know that's a little bit of art and science involved with that. You want to have a detailed name that is informative. On the other hand, you don't want every variable name to be you know forty characters long. And uh, that's going to carry over no matter what language uh, uh, you're writing in. So I think having at least one good example is important, and then allowing students to specialize and get really good in another language, I think, is also is also fine. I think it, sh it should be okay for students to turn in uh, assignments and written in different languages, as long again as they run on someone else's computer who who doesn't normally use that language. And I, I think that's the challenge. Is oftentimes it doesn't run on someone else's computer. And that's when you run into these uh, uh, these challenges. Yeah, I do. I do think it's a it's a particularly difficult problem for sociology in that um, the the expense issue for the fact that R is is um, cheaper is a very compelling uh, argument. In addition, you know, I have a lot of 
philosophical uh, beliefs supporting the idea of openness and 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 such. And yet, um, Seda is a lot more as a language. I think is a lot more accessible for doing uh, analysis to people who are who are novices. Um, uh, there's just so many. Once you start to try to explain stuff about R to to people, um, it to students who are relatively uh, on the early part of their skill development curve, uh, to try to get them to that next level, there's just a lot of things that they kind of need to to understand. I, you know, I mean, I think in an ideal world, um, the successor to Stata in social science would have been Python, and maybe maybe it will be. Uh, but uh, but you know right now in in my world it's more it's more R and I think that's unfortunate just because Python syntax and so many things are a lot cleaner uh, and R just has so many it has so many quirks and things you have to explain about like you know you have to make the decision is it base R or tidyverse R and all of that uh, is uh, use this package or that pa that kind of thing whereas you have an official stata. You have something where you don't start getting into little narratives about well, this part. I know this person who writes this package, and this is yeah, that that part to me makes R tougher to teach with than I would like, considering the gigantic advantage being free software is. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Mario Maliki. Uh, the question is: Are there initi any initiatives at your institutions that focus on teaching the educators? on reproducibility and push button uh, reproducibility so that they can better teach the students? Or is it too late? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm unaware of any at, at my institution. Uh, in, in general, I, I think, I mean, I think the, the professions are starting to uh, get more serious about this, but there's not, there, there historically has not been a lot of resources for this. Um, this is one reason, frankly, why why I wrote my my coding guide is uh, because I kept having to to teach all of this to my RAs over and over again. Um, and instead of doing that, I decided to at least have one centralized repository that that I can use that uh, makes you know, makes it a little bit easier for me at least. Um, but but I think there's not there's not that many resources out there, but they're growing. There's more and more available every year. Um, so I I think we're getting there, um, but it it takes time. Okay, now I have a question from me. Uh, uh, so I'm also the data editor for the Canadian Journal of Economics. And um, I wanted to know if you've incorporated in your teaching um, uh, using uh, de deposits, replication packages from other papers that have been published. And so are our archives useful in your teaching about reproducibility? It could be, um, you know, the AEA as the Open ICPSR. Um, other journals use the Nodo or various um, uh, deposits, or repositories where they can find the uh, the information, all the code and data associated with papers. Well, I can I can jump in with a resounding yes in terms of I don't know I I don't know the Canadian journal specifically, but I I can say that that. Um, Looking the the ability to point people who don't otherwise have great examples of code to look at to good uh, existing examples in papers that appear in high profile places and have their code available is uh, is a great advantage. It is something that as an instructor you have to curate in the sense that that a lot of a lot of it's just it's for the reasons that Julian mentioned earlier. There are a lot of papers, like if you go to econ journals, that are way too complicated in terms of uh, in terms of the analysis steps that are involved to be great uh, exemplars. So you kind of need to, to uh, look at several and, and figure out one. That, like, look, hey, hey, students, look at this as an example of somebody doing things right. But I think that's it's one of the signal advantages. I mean. You know, Julia mentioned the idea of building off others' codes, which is of course important. But even if you're not building off it in a direct way, having that kind of model exemplar to look at is such a valuable and vast contribution that I, I certainly find myself 
referring people to archives of econ articles and poli sci articles that do it well. Yeah, I have a follow up, but, but David, before you jump in, I have a follow up sure. for Jeremy. So uh, you mentioned that uh, journals and sociology don't ask for this. Uh, do you think they will soon or? Uh, well, the uh, uh, sociological science, uh, which I'm a uh, deputy editor for, um, is uh, I think the first English language uh, journal to have what I would consider a modern uh, reproducibility policy, although and there's another English one, uh, German sociology, European sociology has been on this for uh, longer. Uh, the major source of resistance in sociology at a larger level is fights between qualitative and quantitative research and is kind of blocked on that issue. And that that's going to be a tough thing to navigate. Um, but it's it's startling that demography, which is a quantitative field that is mostly in sociology, has not made larger strides on this than it is because it doesn't have that barrier. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just add, I, I do like to use uh, open data and code in my classes when I can. Um, the, the main data, data analytics class I teach currently is for master's students. Um, one issue that we do run into is, uh, again, as Jeremy alluded to, some of the analyses are, that are available are just, you know, they're very complicated, they're large, or they're huge data sets. Um, and so, you know, for, for teaching purposes, you want, you know, smaller data sets and things that are very, uh, very simple. Um, ideally, even rather than having an archive, something that's been uploaded to, to GitHub and can be loaded directly uh, from the web. Um, so uh, in, in, in my teaching, I've actually done that using um, my, my own paper. So I have an RCT um, that I published a few years ago and also a regression is continuity paper. I have put all the data available on GitHub and they're small data sets so they can be run in class and loaded directly from the web. Um, and so I, I have used that in some of my teaching and, and in some case studies. Um, and I certainly encourage uh, authors to go, you know, even above and beyond what, what is uh, required by the, uh, the the many data editors, if possible, um, to put something available that's in, in GitHub on in a very user-friendly format that can be taught sort of on the fly in class. Um, I think in some papers, it's not gonna be possible, but I think for teaching, every thing that you can do that makes it easier for the instructor and the student to use the data and the code, I think that's gonna make it more likely that people uh, will use it. Um, and so I think a lot of the archives, they're great for if you actually need to reproduce the paper and build on the work. Sometimes for teaching, especially if it's like with master's students, it may still be a little bit uh, involved. David? Uh, I was just gonna add that, you know, uh... I, I have a distinct memory from as a recent student uh, from a class where you know we did a, a sort of a reproduction somewhere between rep replicability reproduction uh, uh, of an analysis from the paper, and I think it was initially is it was intentionally chosen as a like very difficult thing to reproduce as a uh, sort of a here's one way you can go about doing this. Um, Part of the lesson being don't do this with your own research. Um, I think uh, I'm, I, won't, I won't say anything more about you know what the paper was or anything like that. But I think that that was that was a, that was a, an implicit lesson that I think could have been made explicit with a, a, a contrast with a, a very straightforward, smaller, well documented depository. Uh, and and I do think that you know in my own research I've I've accessed these these um, replication deposits for, for multiple papers, um, from multiple journals. Um, it, it's, it really is an invaluable thing for somebody earlier in their career to sort of understand uh, what is happening underneath the hood of a specific analysis or a specific paper. Um, I think, you know, I think right now it, it takes a lot of initiative for, for students to understand that these resources are out there, but I, I think the knowledge is growing. Well, um, I believe we have no further questions. Uh, so unless Jeremy, Julian, David, you wanna ask uh, a question to somebody else on the panel? 
I would like to thank you all for attending the CRES webinar uh, on the integration of reproducibility into social science graduate education. And I want to thank our speakers, Julian Reif, Jeremy Fries, David Wasser for presenting and our audience member for attending and asking questions. This was our last session of the year, all of which can be found on our website as recordings, many of slides, uh, the slide sets and the write-ups. Um, we will start up again in the fall, so stay tuned and uh, please monitor our websites uh, that you can see uh, in the chat. Um, and uh, you will find there uh, all our information on our past year and soon you will also find uh, uh, information for the upcoming year. And um, there's one last question that just entered. Uh, it, the question is, um, are there um, any open uh, curricula for the courses that can be shared for reproducibility courses? So a question on um, if there are uh, information available, uh, open curricula for uh, courses that can be shared. If you are aware of such things, um, let us know. Uh, just one thing I, I will add quickly. I, I have some uh, repositories available on my website that contain fully reproducible analyses, you know, push button from beginning to end uh, uh, for a few of my papers. Um, and so they're, they're available there to, to use it if you like in, in a class as an example uh, or as a template. So. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.